Because of this one adaptation, the female needs to mate only once to remain pregnant for the rest of her life. Her one act of sex can yield hundreds of thousands of offspring, a remarkable ratio. This benefits the female in more ways than one. Mating in itself is costly. The more a female mates, the lower her probability of survival. Um, perhaps because there's some damage that occurs, they might be at risk of predation, and there's even some seminal fluids that carry toxins that decrease female survival. After her one act of sex, the female carries fertilized eggs with her throughout her entire life. So every female in the colony has the potential to become a colony herself. In pest control, what's really scary to us then is if you happen to have uh, a German cockroach in the cuff of your pants or in your pocket or in a box that comes from the grocery store and it happens to be a pregnant female, that's all that's needed to get an entire population going. This adaptation has given the species the ultimate survival advantage. When you look at the whole evolution of animals, these started out 400 million years ago and are continuing to be very successful. You know, when it comes to looking at reproductive biology, you've got to say that cockroaches are a superstar. The battle of the sexes has made cockroaches, together with the rest of the insects, the most diverse group of animals on Earth. The drive to reproduce shapes not only insect life, but mammals as well, including us. Everywhere in the natural world, sex gets everyone bent out of shape. Animals will do anything to mate. The drive to pass on genes and ensure survival of the species is so strong that it causes evolutionary changes. This process is called sexual selection. It's a type of natural selection, but it's the kind of selection for the kind of traits that evolve not to survive another day, but to win at the mating game. To be successful in evolutionary terms, your genes have to be in the next generation. As soon as you have sexual reproduction, what you're doing is going out into the environment and looking for other individuals that are doing well and trying to get some of their genes into your offspring. You need to assess how everybody in your population is doing in terms of their reproductive output. The game of courtship in the animal kingdom is largely typecast. For the most part, males display, females choose. There's not an animal on this planet in the wild that will copulate with anybody. They all have favorites. Too old, too young, too scruffy, too stupid acting, and they won't do it. And for good reason, because an animal only has a few chances to pass their DNA on into tomorrow. And so they want to do it with the kind of individual that will really enable them to survive. And females can often have really weird criteria by which they choose which male they're going to mate with. Sexual selection has had huge consequences. Males of a species, they have to compete with each other to find a female, gives rise to a whole different set of behaviors and appearances in animals that compete with other males and try to get a female mate. For example, a moose uses its antlers to fight other moose in order to win the opportunity to copulate with certain females. So there's two types of traits that evolve for sexual selection. One are traits simply to fight off uh, members of your own gender, and others are traits to attract the opposite sex. The pressures of sexual selection worked on the male stock-eyed fly to compete for the largest eye stalk, on the male finch to sing and to show red on the rhinoceros beetle to grow massive fighting horns, on the male lion to grow his mane, and on the male giraffe to grow a powerful long neck. Some forms of sexual selection can actually drive species extinct because the traits that females prefer are so elaborate that they actually get in the way of day-to-day -day lives of males. Take the case of the Irish elk, the ancient cousin of Europe's fallow deer, 
females really liked big antlers, and so over time, males with large antlers were selected over males with smaller antlers. Over progressive generations, the average size of antlers in the population got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, the antlers got so big that they were at the very limit of what an animal can sustain and still survive in its environment. And ultimately, the Irish elk went extinct, and a lot of people think that it went extinct because its antlers were just too big. But even after the rams have butt heads and the mating has begun, in some species, the female has more work to do to be sure the goods are delivered. The female or the male approach each other, then the male mounts the female. After one, two seconds, the female starts calling. German primatologist Donna Pfefferle works with a unique group of wild macaques who live atop the Rock of Gibraltar. She came here to investigate the mystery of why female macaques cry out so loudly during sex. Over two mating seasons, she recorded the macaques, focusing on the frequency and intensity of the female's cries. She then looked for differences between the females who made noise and the females who didn't. What she found was extraordinary. Far more of the noisy females became pregnant. The earlier, the faster, and with the higher peak frequency, the female calls, the more likely the male is to ejaculate. In fact, males were 10 times more likely to ejaculate with a calling female than with a silent one. Pfefferly concluded that the females evolved the loud sex noises in a clear case of sexual selection. The noises increased the odds of bearing young. They're screaming and shouting for a reason. If he doesn't ejaculate, then what's going to happen is she's not going to conceive. So what she's got to do is she's got to encourage him. Eric Shaw has spent years closely observing the Gibraltar macaques, who are known for one thing, sex. They have sex on average once an hour. And they have evolved to use it for social purposes. Kevin. No, but we've got free-ranging primates here that we know have been here for 300 years. I know, I know, I know. Stop panicking. There's a lot of questions that they can answer for us. Be it a question of how to feed them, or be it a question of sex. For these primates, sex is part of how the community communicates and bonds. They use their sexuality in a lot of ways, like we do, I suppose. You had a male and a female here, and he threatened her because you're a little bit too close to my food. To stop the threat, she presents herself. In other words, take me a mule. Here we go. That was sheer, total submission and passiveness. She presented herself. I'm not a threat. He decided to go all the way this time and accept her submission. And now there's peace in the world. The macaque community needs order to keep their elaborate social network intact. There are little families within families. You know, one female will have five children over here, another will have four over there. But they need this protection. They need this cohesion. They need to move as a troop. With primates like macaques, sex moves beyond its primary function and is put to many different uses. The scientists call these behaviors sexual currency. Primates have developed sexual reproduction to an elaborate art. No longer is it just a physical coming together with no consequences other than reproduction. Now it's the fulcrum of many different aspects of primate societies. A lot of the primates will exchange food for sex, express power with their sexuality, express friendship with their sexuality. Sex is a very powerful exchange mechanism. The mix of sex for reproduction and social purposes evolved by primates like the macaque set the stage for the human sexuality that was to come. Humans would add one more most unusual layer to the evolution of sex. 
human beings began to emerge as distinct from our primate cousins just a few million years ago. When our ancestors came down out of the trees and began to stand up on two feet instead of four, they also changed some of their sexual anatomy. Helen Fisher studies the evolution of human sex. The female uh, vaginal canal is no longer tipped backwards the way it is among chimpanzees. It evolved to move somewhat forward, probably for easier access uh, during the missionary position. As the female's anatomy changed, so did the male's. The penis had to reach deeper into the female's body, so it evolved to become significantly larger. Today, humans have the biggest penis of any primate and the most highly developed brain. I think the human beings made their biggest leap in terms of sexuality with the evolution of the brain. Over time, the human brain grew large, so large that its hard skull became a threat to successful reproduction. At some point during human evolution, we began to not only to stand up on two feet instead of four, but the brain got to be too large for the birth canal. At that point, women began to have to bear their babies sooner so they could get out of the birth canal. No one knows how long the first human mothers carried their young. But we do know that today, a 21-month pregnancy would be necessary for a human baby to be born as fully developed as a newborn chimp. With every human born essentially premature, family bonds became a necessity for survival of the species. And that necessity, argues Fisher, explains the mystery of love. As we evolved babies that would have a very long childhood and even adolescence, we began to need to sustain a partnership with somebody long term. And thus we see the evolution of these dramatic love and deep attachment to a partner. Fisher studies the specific areas of the brain involved in sex and love. Inside an MRI machine, subjects are directed to think about their lover by looking at his or her photograph. As they do, their MRI lights up with regions of intense activity. An entire brain system devoted to love. By two million years ago, we began to build this very large cortex. And then suddenly, sex and mind became interconnected. These brain systems for the sex drive and for romantic love are woven deep into primitive parts of the human brain. Humans forever changed sex with the evolution of love. And now, humans are going a step further, taking our evolution into our own hands and separating it from the act of sex. Sex has become futuristic. There's all kinds of ways now to basically bypass sex. We can clone individuals in a Petri dish. There's all sorts of ways to fertilize individuals without engaging in intercourse. What is occurring today is that biology is beginning to manipulate those processes to alter its own self and to take control of its own future evolution. So it's becoming a very conscious thing. And 100 years, 200 years from now, as we move forward, the process of human evolution is going to be directed by human choice. Gregory Stock is a biophysicist and the author of a book entitled Redesigning Humans. He is an advocate of human genetic engineering. And I could see a time when it's viewed as just kind of careless to conceive of children by the old ways, where it's just some random meeting of egg and sperm. How could you be so careless about something as important as a child? Stock believes the logical first step will be genetic screening, a process in which couples will be able to bring their sperm and egg together in the lab to generate multiple embryos, then pick the one with the most desirable traits. So I think it'll be the parents will make choices about their children that are a little bit different from themselves, but really resonate with their own personalities. If they're really outgoing, 
They'll want children that are outgoing. If they're really conscious about their own intelligence, they'll choose kids that have a little leg up in that realm. If they're really athletic, they're going to want an athlete. And I see an enormous diversity as we go out into the future. We already are living in the age of engineered reproduction. The first so-called test tube baby is now in her 30s. Successfully cloned animals include the mouse, sheep, cattle, cat, horse, and chimp. Theoretically, the technology to clone humans exists, but hasn't yet been used. For stock, a future of engineered humanity would simply be a new phase in evolution. Consciousness having evolved to the point where it can chart its own future. As you begin to have meaningful choices, things that can be done that people consider to be of value, for instance, a genetic screening so that you're, you can be absolutely certain that your child is going to be very, very healthy, then I think you're going to get these technologies used in a very, very broad fashion. Natural selection has made some bad choices in the past. An awful lot of people have very bad backs. They've got bad shoulders. They pull out various parts of the body because it's not yet perfectly evolved. And if we could make some changes in selection so that we get rid of genetic diseases, it would be an improvement. As humans move to take the reins of their own reproductive evolution, a vital debate has begun. Genetic engineering in humans is a very risky activity. The problem is that by introducing variation, we might not know